Glad to see you came back. Joining me now to talk more about this government takeover of education and small business creation. Joining me is Republican strategist and former congressional candidate Lenny McAllister. Also, Chuck DeVore, who served as a Republican member of the California State Assembly from 2004 to 2010. And Chuck is currently the vice president of public policy at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Now, Chuck, I want to go to you first because I know you from California. Yes. We uh, were Lincoln Fellows at the Claremont Institute. You are in Texas now. Yes, I am. So why, why the move from California to Texas? Well, I see Texas as a refuge of liberty right now and a sea of oppression in America. Uh, I guess you could say I had a front row seat as a state assemblyman for six years in the state of California while California raised taxes and layered on regulation after regulation. I used to work in the aerospace industry before I was elected and most of my employer base had moved out of state. There were no big headquarters left in California anymore and I had to take care of my in-laws. I had to look after my family and I found that I could do so far more effectively in Texas than I could in California. Well, you know, I've been reading a lot of polls, and uh, in a lot of the business polls, California is rated the third worst state in the country. Yeah, woo uh, in terms New York. Of, in, <laughs> exactly, in terms of job migration, and Texas is uh, first in terms of job immigration. That's right. Lenny, you uh, living in Chicago, and the state of Illinois, Illinois usually ranks in the middle. And it's almost like it's two different states. When you start looking at the, the regulatory practices that generally hamper the state from a tax perspective, you see that the unemployment rate stays high. You, so you have the culture of Chicago and you have downstate Illinois where you have a little bit more relaxation, a little bit more of a smaller government perspective. But as you start getting that influence from Chicago, you start getting into the Chicago-style politics that the nation is now very familiar with. Yeah. You start seeing that there's a stubborn unemployment rate. There's a stubborn taxation climate that's there. I and mean, you constantly have big businesses, people that have been in Illinois for years, threatening to leave the state due to the corruption and the inability to really get the economy there going. You know, we were talking earlier, and the uh, unemployment rate in Illinois is about 10 percent. It's about 9.5 percent going towards 10 percent. It's been stubborn there overnight. In California, it's 10.7 percent. Uh, how big a factor? I talked a lot about regulation, my displeasure with dealing with bureaucracy in my business. How important a factor is regulation in uh, in, in the migration of jobs out of Illinois, out of California. Yeah, regulation is really a, a difficult thing to quantify because there's no price tag traditionally put on regulation and yet it results in a lot of lost productivity and time. People who don't take risks, people who don't start businesses because of the pile of paperwork. Back in 2006, California's legislature actually ordered a study on the cost, the regulatory compliance cost for small business in California. The study took three years. In fact, uh, it was held up and the legislature had to pressure Schwarzenegger to release it because he was embarrassed about it. And the findings were... And he was a Republican. He, in name, yes he was. <laughs> and the findings were stunning. The report estimated that the average regulatory compliance cost for small businesses in California was $134,000 per year per business. You're talking about regulations. You're not talking about the cost of labor. I'm just talking about regulation. So basically for that 134 grand, if, if you had like an auto parts store like my dad did when I was growing up, that's a, what, three or four employees that you'd have to hire the equivalent of to work your way through the myriad of paperwork that you have to file just so that you aren't sent to jail or fined. So this is the impact on, on unemployment. We see high unemployment, the cost of regulation is, is costing jobs. Lenny, I know you ran for Congress in Chicago. Uh, just briefly, when I opened my store, we were able to hire seven, eight people. We provided jobs. In Chicago, you were running for uh, the seat formerly held by Jesse Jackson, Jr. So my question, I don't know if I'm forming it correctly, is how do you, how do you invigorate inner cities, urban areas uh, with jobs 
when you have regulations that are, 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 are keeping the unemployment numbers high. Well, Joseph, it goes back to the whole issue of good small government versus big government. You, not, you have government trying to protect the American, uh, rather than allowing the American to chase that American dream. For example, you not only have the regulation that we were talking about in California and in Illinois, but you also have the inflated, un you have the inflated unemployment rate due to these inflated minimum wages. So what you're doing is you're trying to protect the consumer with overregulation. You're trying to protect the worker with inflated uh, minimum wages. And the combined result is you end up finding that workers can't find jobs that are more than just entry-level jobs. So you're increasing the minimum wage through regulation, through these bad laws, but you're not getting to the secondary and tertiary jobs that create careers and not just jobs. So now you have people fighting for jobs that can't support their families rather than having the freedom to create career, career, um, careers, excuse careers. me, and be able to chase that American dream and have sustainability for their families. Well, you, br you bring up uh, minimum wage laws. State of California is going to raise the minimum wage uh, probably by something like uh, 40 percent. Uh, we have the, the uh, people protesting now, workers, people who are hardworking who want a $15 living wage. Uh, is, well, let me just ask this, is, is that a reasonable request of people who do need money to right. live on? The first thing that folks have to understand is that when you raise minimum wages to whatever you want to raise it to, you also raise unemployment. Uh, it, it, there's no free lunch in this. You, uh, when you raise minimum wages, you also raise prices, so everybody has to pay more. Now, it used to be that entry-level jobs were for young people, and they were training grounds to learn how to show up to work on time, how to be responsible, how to develop those good work habits that then led to a better career later on. And many of us uh, had such jobs. I used to clean condominiums uh, when I uh, was a, a kid in high school living up in a ski resort in California. I worked in my uncle's gas station. I worked in my dad's auto parts store, uh, usually at minimum wage. Uh, and those uh, work habits taught me uh, how to be a more effective employee later on. Now, when you start to raise the minimum wage, what you're doing is you're freezing out an entire group of people who will never have that opportunity for that first job. And you're going to exacerbate the problem. You're also going to prevent people from creating new businesses and jobs. Let me just pause right there. Lenny, when we come back from this break, uh, I want you to talk about 50% uh, 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 black youth unemployment rate, and I'm asking you because you uh, work and live in an urban environment. So I want you to talk about teenage unemployment, black teenage unemployment, uh, and how small businesses can help that, how regulation kills it, that and a lot more when we come back. Hi, welcome back to the Glenn Beck program. I'm Joseph C. Phillips sitting in for Glenn. If you're just joining us, uh, my guest, Lenny McAllister and Chuck DeVore, we're talking about unemployment, we're talking about job creation, government regulation of small businesses. Lenny, before we went to the break, we were talking about the uh, youth unemployment rate, which I think is higher than it's ever been in history, and uh, the black youth unemployment rate is over 50 percent. Uh, you live and work in an urban environment. Uh, what are the impediments to job creation in these areas? I think we have to make it more attractive to bring businesses back there. And as you well know, small business is the engine to get the whole invigoration of a community back in place. So you lose out of these opportunities when you don't allow there to be a, a tax structure or a community structure that allows for small businesses to grow. You lose out on an opportunity to have apprenticeships where you learn those first skills at 16, 17, 18 years old on how to do business the right way, how to talk to somebody eye to eye, how to keep track of money, how to manage your time. These are life skills that help people be successful. A millionaire and a billionaire learn 
time management, learn money management, 14, 15, 16 years old. So we have to make sure that we start putting tax policy, start putting creation of jobs and make that be at the forefront, not the back and forth type of sociological battles that we see from the left far too often that move us away from what matters, which is this. We're wasting too much human capital in our urban environments. It used to be a time 50 years ago. Talk about I have a dream. 50 years ago, you can go into black ghettos and find future scientists, find future doctors, find future leaders. Nowadays, what do you have there? If you don't have the hope and you don't have the things that create those incubators for future leaders, what do we expect to get? And that's what we're facing right now. We have to get those impediments out of the way to get back to a point in time where we can get that talent back to leading America. Okay, well, you mentioned tax policy. I was complaining in my monologue about the county assessment. Well, I happen to know that the county assesses businesses as they do because they have to pay for schools, they have to pay for a lot of things that the city and county does. How is a municipality supposed to pay for all of those things if they don't tax? Well, you have, you have to drive the revenue. But the bottom line is you can either drive the revenue with a high rate and a few businesses Right. or a lot more businesses in a lower rate. Right. And when you have more businesses competing, now you're having innovation. Once you start having that into play, you're basically taking the best of what America is and right. you're allowing it to drive us back to the very top of what we're supposed to be in this global economy. Let, let me give you three statistics that I think will shock a lot of the viewers of this program. And they're, and they're very basic. California, at the state and local level, taxes 42 percent more of its income than is the case in Texas. 42 percent more. Now, according to a new U.S. Census Bureau survey that takes into account when looking at poverty, cost of living and the value of government benefits, different welfare benefits, this is a new way of looking at poverty. California has the highest poverty rate in the nation, higher than Washington, D.C., at 23.5 percent. Now, Proportionately compared to Texas, California has 42% more people in poverty than does Texas. So 42% higher tax rate, 42% higher poverty rate proportionately. Now what's amazing about this is demographically the two biggest states in the nation where 20% of Americans live are very similar. Same precise percentage of Hispanics. Texas has double the number of African Americans. California has well, more good Asians. Can't blame it on us. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Prosperity. And here's the third point then. So the states are very similar, right, but yet 42% more poverty in California. Here's the last data point. In 2011, with revised data, the federal government now says that Texas, not California, has the higher per capita gross domestic product, and that gap widened in 2012. That means that the average Texan produces more goods and services than does the average Californian. And that's a state with Hollywood and Silicon Valley? But Are Chuck, you kidding people me? Say, they say, well, that's because they're drilling all that oil in Texas. And California won't, uh, won't allow the, the shale and the, the right. fracking. Well, well, two things about that. In, in Texas, the, in, the industrial sector is actually bigger than the oil and gas sector. So there's actually more industry than there is oil and gas. And California... Yes, California has had declining oil and gas production for decades now, but did you know that California has two-thirds of America's shale reserves? They just, as you said, their policies don't allow people to get at it, but they have it. Well, okay. You know, we're sitting here talking, sitting on the couch, a lot of good ideas. The problem is that when you go to Sacramento, when you're in uh, uh, Springfield, <laughs> Springfield uh, you, you have it has to be turned into policy right so what's the trick we've got about a minute before we have to break what is the trick taking these good ideas turning them into policy it's it's time for Americans to start voting with their heads and their hearts not their habits and too many Americans are used to voting the habit of the same person that I've always seen in there I'm going to continue to give that incumbency another chance it's time to vote with our heads what do we see what are the results Vote with our hearts. What do we feel? Where do we need to go with our country? Not just our habits. Well, I'd say that and the fact that uh, I think you're going to start to see an awakening uh, within minority communities all over uh, America. Given this president's abysmal economic record, I think that America could benefit from more minorities coming into politics 
taking the experience that they've had as being successful entrepreneurs and inspiring their communities and saying, look, I did it, and it wasn't government, really. I built the business. Well, what you're talking about, Chuck, I think are uh, minority uh, candidates who might be running under the banner of the GOP. Um, I'm not so sure with these voter ID laws that that is uh, going to be happening. So <laughs> that's a tease coming up, voter ID laws, and we're going to be talking about how the left is fighting them. Uh, we're going to be talking about that when we come back. Lenny and Chuck, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.